from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone. I want to welcome you to another episode of Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, also known as the Six Foot Mama. There have been a lot of great things happening in my gardening world this past week. First, the sun has been shining in Minnesota. That is big news. So people are finally getting into their gardens, myself included. I've been busy with planting edibles. And now that it's warming up, I'm putting my tomatoes in the South Patio Garden. I'll have a post on sixfootmama.com next week about the varieties of tomatoes I'm growing this season. They're all new to me, so it'll be a little bit of an experiment, but I'm looking forward to it. I also direct sowed more lettuce varieties in my kitchen garden. And here's a tip I like to share. By growing a variety of salad greens, you're less likely to get bored with your salad options. So if you're not crazy about something or you're just not using it the way you thought you would, in three or four weeks when it's petered out, just try a new crop to add to your salad greens. Right now, I'm creating fun combinations with sweet spinach, red lettuce, butter lettuce, Swiss chard, dill, and mint. Secondly, many gardeners are thrilled to find that most of the nurseries are starting to discount their plants. Most notably here in the Twin Cities, the Linder's flower markets have all discounted everything. Their annuals, perennials, edibles, houseplants, all of them at 50% off. That sale has been a little dangerous for my credit card. Nonetheless, watch my blog this week as I share some of the amazing plants I found at this fantastic sale. And if you get a chance, you should stop by yourself. Finally, if you're in the Maple Grove area this weekend, be sure to check out the third annual Girl Time event. I'll be speaking about kitchen gardening at the Arts Center this Saturday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. So feel free to stop by and say hello. Now let's turn our attention to the wonderful interview I want to share with you today. My co-host, fellow master gardener and friend, Mary Lynn Kenknight and I were fortunate enough to interview Don Ingebretson, the renegade gardener, last Wednesday. Wednesday evening. We had so much fun and learned more than we could have ever anticipated by listening to Don. And it quickly became apparent that an hour interview was just not going to be enough to capture all the things we wanted to talk to Don about. So Don's interview is broken into two separate shows. The first half of the interview will be featured in today's podcast. And next Friday, I will release part two. I'm certain you will enjoy this interview. Don is a wealth of knowledge and an honest plantsman. Let's cue the interview. Hi there, everyone. We want to welcome you to Still Growing. Today, my co-host is my friend and master gardener, Mary Lynn Ken Knight. And we're both very excited about this show, aren't we? Yes, we are. My guest today is Don Ingebretson, the renegade gardener. And we're going to devote the entire show to learning as much as we can from this wise, generous, and status quo challenging gardener. Don Ingebretson, the Renegade Gardener, aims to empower gardeners through education, specifically by teaching them to put aside gardening myths like you should never cut down a tree on your property or that large lawns are a good idea and so forth. Don has appeared on HDTV's Typical Mary Ellen and PBS's Home Time. He writes gardening books, has been published in all sorts of magazines, including Better Homes and Gardens, Midwest Living, Landscape Solutions, and many more. Don also has an active national speaking calendar. Spring through fall, Don owns a landscape design and installation company specializing in residential landscape renovation and custom stonework. You can also find Don at therenegadegardener.com, which happens to be one of the oldest and most independent garden websites out there. The archive on this website is incredible, so check it out. Welcome, Don. Jennifer, Mary Lynn, wow, what an introduction. This had better be good. Good to be on with both of you guys. This should be fun. Yes, it will. How did you come by the moniker, the Renegade Gardener? Was it given to you by someone, or did it sort of evolve over time? It, it evolved over a year. I started, I was an avid gardener. I was working in the, in the, in the corporate world, um, you know, spending my days at, at, a, at a desk, um, 
um, thinking about what I wanted to do in my garden when I got home from work. Uh, and I started, uh, I started writing. I'd always been a writer. I, I studied journalism and English at the University of Minnesota. But when I graduated, I went right into the workforce and uh, never, I, I wrote for the company that I worked for, for the several companies I worked for, but it was all business writing. So about 97, 1997, I ran into a neat young guy, became a friend of his, and he was the editor of a large uh, weekly newspaper that, that serves kind of the western metro of the Twin Cities, quite a successful paper. And I said to him, you should have a gardening column because I, I read the paper. I read that weekly, Lakeshore Weekly News, still in publication. I said, you should have a gardening column. He said, I'd love to have a gardening column. Why don't you write it? 500 words a week, penny a word, 50 bucks a column. And I said, great, I'll try it. So I started writing a column for a little local, or not a little, but a fairly large local weekly. And I, I had to come up with a name for the column. So the first year it was Garden Glimpse. I thought, you know, 500 words, Garden Glimpse. Yep. Well, I started publishing it, and it, it proved successful. He got very positive feedback from readers. And so the second year, about the same time, he said to me, you should start a website. This was just when people were first starting websites. I mean, this is 15, 16 years ago. And he said, yeah, because you can just archive all your articles on it. And I said, yeah, great idea. So now I had to think about a website, and I thought, he said, also, we should come up with a new name for the column. So I just started thinking about it and thinking about it. And I had already, my writing style was evolving so that it was kind of pissy and humorous. And I was, I was calling out, you know, things that I, flaws that I saw in the nursery industry and some of the, some of the foolish, foolish products and even ridiculous plants that they were foistering upon the, the public. And it had always had kind of an, it was always kind of an edgy column. And uh, Renegade Gardener just popped into my head. And, of course, it had good alliteration. Yep. And uh, I thought, you know, Renegade Gardener uh, is a great moniker. So I trademarked it. It actually is, is trademarked, nationally trademarked to me. And then I started RenegadeGardener.com, uh, my website. And we changed the column name to Renegade Gardener. And then uh, that sort of became my, my nom de plume when I started Appearing at shows and speaking and doing public speaking, I was uh, and on 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 uh, you know PBS, I was Don Ingebret and the Renegade Gardener. So it 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 served me well. That's a great story. You write on your website that you appreciate the art and effort required to learn the Latin names of plants. What are tips for gardeners who want to develop this skill? Well. First of all, uh, you know, in, insist on them. I mean, it, 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 I, I don't want to spend the hour on this topic, so I'll make it brief. Um, you know, gardening is a hobby like any other. If you learn sewing, there's a vernacular. If you are a sailor, uh, you know, there's the head. There's there's starboard and whatever the other one is. There's, uh, you know, there there are terms. There are terms in fly fishing. There's the J cast. There's various minutia that's involved in the vernacular of a hobby. So gardening is no, is no different. Um, the key reason to learn the botanical Latins is that only that name identifies the plant. I mean, you know, let's say you see a plant and, oh, well, what's that? And there's, oh, that's bachelor's buttons. Oh, I want to grow that. So you go to the nursery and you ask for bachelor's buttons. Well, Bachelor's buttons identifies about 15 different perennials, depending completely different perennials, depending on where you are in the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, as, I mean, uh, there are so many misnamed, uh, you know, a mountain ash is not an ash. I mean, it, it's only the, the, the Latin, the genus, which, of course, is, is, is the first part of a plant's name. Uh, in italics and capitalized, then the species, uh, and then uh, the uh, the actual cultivar. So let's say you see a beautiful perennial in a friend's garden, and, and they do know the genus. Oh, what's that lovely blue flower? Oh, that's Campanula. Well, again, you go to the nursery or you go you go online, you discover there's 150 Campanulas. It happens to be Campanula, you know, glomerata superba that you're neighbor grows. Well, if you want to grow Campanula glomerata superba, you have to identify, you have to go out and find Campanula glomerata superba. There are, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of plants available in the, in the, uh, in the nursery trade. The silly thing about the discussion too, is that 
Gardner, you already know a lot of the genuses. Hydrangea is the botanical Latin genus for hydrangea. That's a great you know, point. You know, hosta, hosta is the proper botanical Latin, you know, name for for hosta. A still be. You know, there's a lot. Of, so, so the the problem lies in the fact that, that we, the genuses are known for some plants, but then people lapse into the common name for other plants. And it, it simply comes down to when you buy a plant, look at the plant tag. You know, start no, start realize that you're growing, uh, you know, hookera. Uh, and then you can go out and find, you know, uh, the various varieties of, of, of hookera. Um, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it, to me, it just makes things, it makes things simpler and it, it can even be a little snooty, which is never a bad thing, but, uh, uh, it, it, it all comes part and parcel with learning the hobby. Absolutely. So Don, I've had people say to me, I took Don Ingebrigtsen's class and this is what he said. And one of the most, um, wonderful things that I learned from your class without actually taking it was when you said, go into your garden and just spend an hour and enjoy yourself. Sit Mm -hmm. at a potted container of plant in a potted container and just take time to deadhead it, to look at the plant, and just enjoy yourself being in the garden. How much time during the day do you actually commit into your own garden or gardening at all? I mean, your job is gardening. So how much time, what percentage do you spend gardening in a day? Well, it, it, prior to starting a landscape business, see, I, I, I started gardening the minute I bought my first house, you know, in the, in the eighties. And it was a beautiful half acre lot in Deep Haven. I had a lot of mature trees, quite a bit of shade, but I had some sunny spots. I had beautiful soil. I had a house facing south. Um, I had no idea I, I wanted to be a gardener, but when I became a landowner, the gardening bug just bit me. So back in the, and I was working, you know, full time. So back in the good old days, you know, at least an hour or, or, or 90 minutes or so, um, you know, when I'd be home at work or quite often an hour, the, the greatest, the greatest gift of gardening for people who are still in the workforce and have to get up in the morning and go grab the bus to go downtown or they have to commute for 48 minutes or 73 minutes. The greatest trick in the summer is to get up and spend 45 minutes or an hour in your garden before work. Uh, you know, if you just, if you do that once a week, you, you are, you're just, you're just, uh, uh, more alive. You're a better, you know, if you're a teacher, you're, you're, you're a much more loving, benevolent, wise teacher. If you're a computer programmer, you go, you go to work and on that day, you will be the most, you will be the most uh, creative computer programmer because, you know, on that day, you started out with a little gardening. Then on the weekends, you know, it would depend. We have various projects, my wife and I, and, you know, on a weekend, I might spend most of Saturday out if we were doing a renovation or we're expanding beds or I'm planting stuff. But but once once the garden was established, the weekends were more for enjoying and for puttering a little bit. And so I suppose I suppose three to four to even five hours on the weekend. Nowadays that I run a landscape uh, company and, you know, with this lousy weather that we've had and everything else, I mean, sometimes we're working Saturdays. So it, now I'm kind of waiting to the point where I can retire and then spend a bit of every day uh, in my garden. But the the important thing is there, there's really there's two types of people in the world. There's really actually two types of clients in the world. There are people who who have a, a, a lovely landscape installed, and to them it's no different than the than the siding on their house. You know, they never really look at it. Yeah. Um, they there's all this crazy un attainable requests for low maintenance or no maintenance landscaping, which is patently absurd. Um, and, and so, you know, European soft flies get into their pines. Uh, you know, so if you're attuned to your landscape, if you go out and examine your plants every day, or at least, at least, you know, every few days and really get to know them and watch them grow and are, are, are inspired by, by the spring bud break and you, you fall in love with this lovely tree or this or that. When something goes askance, you'll notice it right away. But, you know, other people, they'll have pines on their property and the European sawfly gets in there and, and the trees are half 
denuded and heading towards death, and they still don't notice. They, they don't notice that all of the needles are being eaten off of this pine tree, uh, which, which, which to me is just a little, is just a little bit absurd. Um, you, you need to watch and, and, and revel in your landscape and in your perennials and in your shrubs, uh, just because it's, it's, um, I find it very, very inspiring, but also it's because when, if something starts going wrong, if a fungal disease hits, if pests invade, if you have aphids, you know, people will recognize that much quicker and they can, they can salvage it. They can save it. They can, they can change it. Whereas other people wake up and it's the fall and everything's dead and they go, what happened? So the second type of client would be someone that notices that. Uh, my favorite client, I've had many of them over the years. They, they are people who they're busy. They're maybe they're both, maybe the husband and wife are both working or the husband's working and the, and the, and the mom is, is certainly working, raising the kids, but she's doing this and hockey practice and that. And you plant a lovely landscape for them. And, uh, and they'll come on and say, Oh, wow. I don't know what, what is that? And you'll teach them. You'll tell them that. And you'll tell them how to take care of it. I, I've had several clients, one in particular, my favorite, who was a hard working, hard charging businessman, worked for a major corporation. And I planted a, he had a pretty good sized budget and a brand new house. So it was new home construction. So we did a lot of specialty conifers. He, he, he said, I just wanted to look nice. You know, he didn't know, a, he didn't know a, a petunia from a coffee pot. And five years later, he's, he's a, he's a botanical genius. I mean, five years later, he's, he's an expert. He knows his plants. He, hmm. he loves taking care of them. I used to do, I used to do spring maintenance for him every spring for three years. And then, and then finally he said, no. He said, he said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of the landscape in the spring. So I turned this guy who really didn't care about plants and about landscape into just a gardening fanatic. And now he, he adds plants to the landscape and he, he knows all the names and he, he knows how to care for the plants and, and he takes great pride in his landscape. So that's, that's really the coolest thing. The worst thing is when you plant a gorgeous landscape for somebody and they never, they don't, they don't hire you for the spring maintenance contract. You really never hear from them again, and then you drive by this thing seven years later, and it looks like hell because yeah. uh, because they they didn't they didn't maintain it. You know these people who they they won't drive the Lexus a mile over at three thousand before getting the oil changed, but they think that their trees and shrubs are just going to look good forever without ever lifting a finger. So then, what what part of your career have you found the most difficult? Well, I wouldn't. I've found any of it difficult. But I would say that the only disappointment is when you install a nice landscape and uh, and uh, the, the the homeowner doesn't 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 keep it up. I mean, I can I can install a landscape. You don't have to lift a finger, uh, you know, except for watering or maybe maybe we put in the the proper irrigation system for them. You know, it'll look good in five years. But there's n- there's no such thing as a low maintenance landscape i mean uh, you can't just i don't care if it's if it's you go out and find, google low maintenance plants and low maintenance trees low maintenance shrubs low maintenance perennials and you only plant off of that list five years later uh if you do nothing um you're going to have to go out and do quite a bit of maintenance. I mean, it, it, it's just a complete myth that's been created by the by the gardening and the nursery industry. It, it's the whole, you you see it on my website, and I'm yeah. famous. This, this is the renegade gardener uh, part of me in that the uh, the nursery industry, 10 years ago, they just they just decided to dumb it all down. They were They were concerned that people thought gardening was too difficult. Well, sometimes it is. Uh, they... They, you know, everything has to be easy, foolproof, no problem, low maintenance. And that became the whole marketing ploy of the American gardening industry to try to attract customers. And all they did was, was, was burn people, burn people up. They didn't, people feel, well, I don't have to be educated about this. Well, then their, then their trees die. Yeah. Uh, and, and, or then they start gardening, planting the easy grow and easy care shrubs and this and that. And then the things don't work out and they don't have the skills to, the simple skills to, to, uh, to, uh, fix the problem. And they, they say to heck with gardening. Right. Cause, you know, cause, cause something didn't work out. Well, you know, gardening is, gardening is, 
relatively simple, but it's not always easy. Right. And you had mentioned before, too, that you sparked interest in this gentleman who now took over his garden. He no longer wanted you to do the spring maintenance. Was there anyone in your family that sparked the gardening interest in for you? Yeah, the men. I mean, my grand, my father, my grandfather. I, I'm 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 only I guess three generations away from Norway. My great grandfather came over, uh, uh, and uh, settled in Minnesota, and he was a farmer. And uh, my grandfather uh, was a uh, was a businessman. He actually ran the general store in the small town of Malacca, Minnesota. But he was an avid gardener, and the the men in my family are the gardeners. My father was an avid, avid gardener. Grew tomatoes, grew a fabulous vegetable garden. Um, when growing up as a little boy, it was I was an adult before I realized there were perennials other than chrysanthemum. Hmm. My dad was a chrysanthemum nut, and he planted them in waves, and he planted them by the hundreds, and uh, and of course the fall. And he had about a two. We had grew up on about a about an acre of woods and an acre of, of landscape. And, uh, yeah, dad's, dad's idea of a great weekend was to be able to go out and, and plant shrubs and, and grow perennials. He had fabulous, my grandfather had a fabulous perennial garden that I remember as a young child, just a gorgeous flower garden. So it kind of, it's kind of a male gene in my family. In terms of gardening, are you easily an easily charmed person, or do you purposefully resist popular trends? Well, I don't purposely resist popular trends. I take a look at everything with a grain of salt. Popular trends come and go. I mean, you know, uh, if, if if the trend is water gardening, well, hey, that's you know, that's that's great. I mean, I got no problems with water gardening, and I've installed water gardens. And water gardening is just a further expansion of your of your repertoire and of your palate, uh, and, and they're fabulous, but you know, stuff comes along like, you know, uh, feng shui influences, which is just simply common sense. I mean, you know, don't plant a tree and in, in right directly in front of the front door. Um, <laughs> you know, that's that you don't have to be a feng shui master <laughs> to, to figure that out. So, you know, I know whether it, whether it stops energy from flowing into the house, I don't know, but you don't plant a tree in front of the front door. You know, we knew that in the 1800s. Um, uh, so, you know, the faux trends, I mean, you know, the painted flowers, the, now they're dying, they're dying, uh, uh, they're dying plants, you know, they're dying orchids blue, um, you know, there, there's always, there's always some razzmatazz and some stuff that I think is, is, is pretty ephemeral. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the good trends, uh, use of stone and use of, of, um, artistic representation, which we don't see. And I, I know your podcast goes out all around the country, but really basically being from the Midwest and landscaping in the Midwest, you, you see so little use of art and sculpture and, yeah. And, and accessories in Midwestern and uh, gardens versus the Pacific Northwest and the East Coast. And now that trend is finally reaching us and people are investing in art and they're putting in arbors and they're using structure. And, you know, not everything has to be a plant. Uh, sometimes it's better if you fill some space with boulder outcroppings than, uh, than, than just shrub after shrub after shrub. So, um, you know, certainly I think, I think for the most part that the trends that come down the come down the pike have have, uh, have have pretty good merit but the the trend of low maintenance foolproof you know easy gardening that's that's a trend that I that I always rail against well and it seems like the trend right now is actually more difficult with the vegetable gardening trend do you are you installing any vegetable gardens in people's yards I, I have a couple and again you know a terrific trend how can you Right. How can you be? How, how would you be opposed to a to a trend like that? Edibles and people growing their own. I am seeing, and in, in, in definitely in the last three years, an uptick in people who we're on a project right now. In fact, where a funny little back corner uh, gets full sun, and I and uh, they're very interested in, in in growing edibles back there. So we'll be doing some raised beds back there. A slightly older couple. Is that something um, that you suggest, or that they come to you and ask about? Well, in a part of my preliminary, when I meet with a client, someone emails me or calls me, 
uh, and says, hey, we're interested in landscaping, you know, you know, how does it work? And I say, well, uh, I come out and do a free consultation. If you are, if you raise your hand and say you're interested in hiring a landscaper, then I'll come out and see the property. So that's, that's part of my standard, uh, consultation, uh, just chat with them. You know, how long have you lived here? What, what, are, you know, what's the situation in the household? Are there kids? Are there pets? Um, you know, uh, what are your interests? Do you entertain? Um, you know, tell me about your, your perceived use. Um, are you interested in growing vegetables? You know, so that'll, that'll get covered when I, when I'm kind of doing the, the preliminary consultation. Uh, and then sometimes I, people will contact me and they'll say, Hey, we want to do, uh, we, you know, we bought, just bought a house and it's got a terrible old landscape and we want, we want to see you about completely renovating it. We want a patio. We need, and we need a place to grow vegetables and, you know, so it works both ways. So I know that um, you said that when you go to a person's garden, that you're not coming in just with an idea already planned. Do you think then that you're using more of your intuition when you go there to design a person's garden? Yes, I'd say, I'd say, well, yes, you know, intuition. I mean, there is something to be said. I try not to fall into this category uh, or try to be as limited, but you know, I can drive around the Twin Cities and see a uh, see a landscape renovation uh, that's fairly recent, obviously done by a landscaper and named the landscaper. I mean, there are certain style. I mean, I'll look at that and I won't mention any names because it, because they're, they happen to be beautiful landscapes. But I'll see the same plants. I'll I'll see the same type of stone outcropping it, it's just a signature look and landscapers a lot of them kind of do develop signature looks which which is great i mean it's just like an artist or like a you know you listen to a musical group you know your favorite group or, or something you know you can recognize what you can recognize what band it is when you when you hear the start of the song so there's nothing wrong with it but too many perfunctory i think landscapes just use, you know, it's the same five shrubs, it's the same, it's the same six perennials, it's the same, you know, arborvitae, and it's almost, it's almost, it's the same plants, and all they do is they just change, they just move them around a little bit, uh, depending on the shape of the house and the size of the lot, and I, I try to stay away from that. I have a very broad palette. Um, I'm constantly out looking at new shrubs and and researching new shrubs and and that that's the fun thing is finding stuff that you can add to your palate and uh, 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 planting you know shrubs. I'll give you an example. I mean, Camasiparis king's gold, and I'll mention that because around the country, everyone grows. A lot of people grow Camasiparis king's gold, or sometimes called it's, it's the same plant. Uh, the uh, the variety is called sun gold out in other parts of the country. Gorgeous, golden. A uh, little mop top, uh, this kind of Rastafarian dreadlock, uh, 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 cypressy type uh, uh, foliage to it. It's, it's golden 365 days out of the year. It's hardy to zone four. They grow very well in Minnesota uh, in full sun. They, they, they don't. They're not susceptible to winter burn. They're just these, and they'll they'll grow up. Depends on how you how you prune it and take care of it. But the thing turns into this kind of a you know, four foot wide, just gorgeous golden mop top. And, uh, have yeah, they been available for ever since I started? Well, maybe they came in right about when I started landscaping, hmm. but I, I use them in my designs and the neighbors will go and say, what's that? And they go, well, it's Camel Cypress, King's Gold. It's been around for 12 years and people have never seen it. And here's this gorgeous, gorgeous shrub. And of course, you know, things like magnolias. I mean, uh, uh, Oh, you can grow magnolias up here. Well, of course you can, and they're gorgeous. And uh, you go into you go into. We're doing a job in St. Paul right now, just off of Summit. And you drive around that area and the Crocus Hill area, and everyone's magnolias are in bloom. You know, so there are neighborhoods where everyone knows about magnolias. And then yes. you go out to a you go out to a western or a northern suburb, and 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 people say, you mean there are magnolias you can grow in Minnesota? So expanding your plant palette, and I just encourage people so much in the spring. Uh, even before you know what you want, you know, locate big shrub nurseries. And of course there are plenty of them, uh, in, in, in all major metropolitan areas and just go out and spend an hour or two, just walk around. Don't, 
don't know, you don't have to know what you're looking for. Just walk around and look at cool new plants and check the plant tag and yep. and say, wow, that's really cool. Take the Sunday drive and stop by the nursery. Mm-hmm. Go to your arboreta, um, you know, wholesalers. Um, there are some huge wholesalers in the Twin Cities, and the public can't buy from them, but but they don't care if you show up and drive aisle after aisle after aisle of thousands of of uh, fabulous, colorful trees and shrubs and perennials. So is that how you educate yourself every spring or? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, locally, it's it's heading down to, you know, Minnesota Valley and running over to, to Bailey's and, and driving down to Farmington and, and checking out, uh, um, uh, you know, Bachman's Wholesale. I mean, it's just hundreds, acres and acres and acres of all of the all of the plant material. And of course, every year these 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 large wholesalers are introducing new 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 uh, new plant varieties and new stuff. And you know, the important thing for for homeowners and for 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 gardeners who are listening to this, um, get to know the the, the specialty perennial. Uh, nurseries in your area. You know, it's not going to be the big, uh, you know, box store. I mean, there are, these are typically all quite often family owned and generational, uh, uh, purveyors of, of perennials and trees and shrubs and get to know the, get to know the good ones and get to know the, get to know the owners, get to know the managers. Yeah, you know, even these smaller places, usually the help will be pretty good, but, you know, you want to know who the who the who the shrub buyer is at at a nice big nursery where you go to buy shrubs and get on a first name basis with them and ask them what he or she is bringing in uh, new this season because uh, the good nurseries they test this stuff particularly in the north. I mean that's that's crucial when your zones you know three through five, yeah, which which takes up a lot larger portion of of the country than the nursery industry and most publications will, will ever admit. Um, you know, they don't just bring stuff in for the, for the heck of it. They have, they have field trials. They have test areas. Good, good perennial uh, nursery, nursery men and women, they'll test a perennial for two or three years in their own gardens or in their trials before they offer it for sale to the public. And that is something that you don't see when you go to a big box store because they're always no. selling things that have no business being sold in this cold zone. Quite often, yes. Yeah, had a client, yes, yeah, a client the other day who had some. We'll 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 leave the actual name of the store out of it, but uh, she had planted some stuff, and the plant eggs were still there. And uh, and I took a look at what she had planted. She was trying to grow. Um, Oh, you know, Minnesotans, they always want to try to grow sage. And there's apparently one, there's, there are, there are some semi sages that are kind of, but it's not the stuff that you think it is. And sure enough, she bought it at a local, and the, the plant tag said locally grown, <laughs> hardy fruit. Well, it was a California sage that doesn't have a chance of growing here. So absolutely. I mean, you know, the, if you need 10, the Groot Spire Arborvitae, and you're driving by Home Depot, and the the giant semi is there from Oregon, is there in the in the parking lot, and they're offloading the Groot Spire Arborvitae. Uh, go buy them, you know. But I don't I don't recommend people go to the big box stores or the gas stations or the hardware stores and uh, go around. Uh, 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 picking out their annuals and their and their shrubs, because uh, frankly, and this isn't always true. Every time I bring this up, I get emails from some store manager of some Ace Hardware who says I have trained, you know, master gardeners take care, and I, so I understand that happened. The quality, the quality can vary, but in general, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't buy plants where you can buy plywood and toilet seats. Well, we need to support our nurseries. Absolutely, and that's the other thing. It's, it's just, it's just you know, the box stores, the hardware stores, the gas stations, they're just doing it to make some extra bucks in the spring. You don't really see the plants there too much past spring. And uh, meanwhile, you've got people who are really heavily invested in overwintering plants and in keeping up on gardening trends and in testing plants. And exactly right. I, 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 think, I think that 
uh, you know, professionalism should always be rewarded. Mm-hmm. Right. And I just went to a nursery today that talked about the um, downy mildew for impatience. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to educate the public, too, as to this is why we're selling this, but only for a short time, because we want to protect our other crops that are going to be coming in. Yeah. And again, just for just for Minnesota, I, I, I think Michigan's already on the list. I'm not sure about Wisconsin or Iowa, but. Yeah, what if, if if the listeners are not familiar, uh, 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 impatient downy mildew actually was was um, discovered in a Michigan greenhouse, um, a very large grower, and then uh, you know a type of thing that sells nationally, and then it it took hold out on the east coast, and it's and it's been out to the west coast, and uh, it's it's coming to the it's coming to the Midwest if it hasn't already arrived, and it's just it's just a, there's nothing you can do about it. There's no there's no remedy for it, and impatience uh, develop powdery mildew, and they lose their leaves, they lose their blooms, they they basically wither away. So there are quite a few states in the country right now where they're just they're just not selling them, um, and it's, it's a shame. But you know, then you learn the alternatives. Uh, New Guinea impatience are not susceptible. Uh, thank goodness, you know, impatience, of course, being important for shade. You know, thank goodness we have we have coleus, we have you know, Terenia, we have uh, uh, quite a few alternatives um, for uh, uh, for impatience, and, and it's just like anything else. We just have to wait for the for the disease to to go, and then five years, six years, eight years, we'll be growing impatience again. Hey, is gardening a form of storytelling for you, Don? I would say certainly my personal uh, my personal garden, yes, and and the landscapes that I've installed. Um, you know, over about 15 years. I mean, I'm lucky because I'm still in contact with some people. And of course, clients, good clients are great because 10 years later, they call you up out of the blue and they say, hey, we want to do this now. So I'll go back and there aren't too many early landscapes that I've done that I see where I absolutely wince. Um, But uh, yeah, as I look at my garden and and as I look at at gardens that that are installed for other people, uh, yeah, it, it I mean, um, yeah, it tells my story. I don't, yes. you know, to, to heck with them. I don't, I don't know what, what it means, what it means to them, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly. I mean, and, and I think some of the plants, my best garden, unfortunately, the house was sold. It was a garden that I developed over almost 16, 17 years. So it was really oh. starting to get somewhere. And I still, I still drive by it and I see my Arnold Sentinel pine and I see the beautiful magnolia, Ricky. I always drive by it when I know Ricky's going to be in bloom. Cause, you know, and I have three red buds on the property and I have a beautiful old Uncle Foggy, that fabulous, yes. uh, weeping, yep. um, uh, 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 weeping pine. Yep, that's I've just got one. Oh, you do. You have an, I love Uncle Foggy. Yeah, me yeah, too. It's an interesting plant. You either love it or you hate it. Some people look at it and they go, I don't get it. Other people say, wow, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. So, yes, I have landscapes where I drive by and it's just fun because I remember where I was at and what I was doing and what I was thinking and yep. and why I why I did it that way. And of course, you learn from it. I mean, yes. I try to make every I try to make every landscape every landscape that I install better than the last one. And I sometimes it's not. But the overall, the overall line, you know, goes up. Yeah. So, Don, I need to ask you a question about your redbud tree. Did you plant it in a protected area in your yard? The one in your old yard that you said you you planted three redbud trees in your old. Right. right. Um, I was in Deep Haven, Minnesota, and Deep Haven is protected. I mean, Deep Haven is a <laughs> tiny little village, excuse me. Uh, you know, it's been around for, I mean, it's the village of Deep Haven. It's been around there. There's a, there's a hundred year old general store in Deep Haven. And it's heavily, it's very hilly, heavily wooded. Hence, it was named Deep Haven because an early settler called it a haven deep in the woods. So very mature trees, uh, hilly. It runs along the western, kind of the southwestern shore of Lake Minnetonka. And, uh, the whole area is protected. Now within my actual yard, yes, two of them were protected by a, by a six foot privacy fence. One of them was protected by a stand of, of, uh, <laughs> I'll, just, 
this will this hurts to say it, but a stand of <laughs> techni techni arborvitae that I planted about the second year. This I I let myself off the hook. I didn't know any better. Um, although I maintained them well, and they actually look pretty well. They actually look pretty well. I I, I would have planted something other than technies if it were my yard now, but um, so. Yeah, they're protected. I mean, red buds, you know, as long as you buy northern strain, as long as you buy the, the one developed by the University of Minnesota and the Arboretum, northern strain, which is probably, for Minnesota listeners and Wisconsin and Iowa and North South Dakota, is probably, hopefully, the only variety that you're going to see. Uh, there, No one's going to sell probably, you know, the standard Circus canadensis. But the northern strain is particularly hardy, and uh, I know what you're saying. Uh, I wouldn't plant one out in the backyard of my farm in Fargo uh, because I don't think it's going to make it. Winter wind, uh, excessive frost. Um, I I stand, you know, I stand by northern strain as I don't, you know, it's it's zone for hardy, uh, but uh, yeah, she can use a little winter protection. Do you remember the very first garden that made an impression on you? My grandfather's in Malacca, Minnesota, and I didn't know it at the time, but I just remember he had a, just think of a classic little small town rambler, uh, you know, kind of just off Main Street, in the probably, probably a half acre yard. In the backyard, you walked out and it ran right along the, right, ran right along, the, uh, I think the Rum River. And he just had the classic picket fence, uh, just came out in a U, and uh, it was just filled with perennials. And he grew irises, and he grew peonies, and he grew, he grew, uh, it was just an amazing, amazing perennial uh, garden. And we used to get, you know, the kids would get dumped off there when mom and dad went, you know, when we were really young, when mom and dad were uh, wanted to go off and do something by themselves, my brother and I would go up and it was great oh boy we got to go see go stay with grandma and grandpa for a week up in malacca uh and i remember and, and that was really the first just this is a garden experience i ever saw his entire backyard was just this giant u just a big u-shaped kind of a circular half moon uh perennial garden i, I just used to stand there in awe of just the color and the insects and the bees and the birds and all of the the way that this this garden just hummed i mean it just had this palpable energy um uh, that i that i that i think uh i think probably had an influence on me that's a great memory what have you learned from writing about plants that you didn't appreciate from spending time in the garden well interesting question that in some ways and they're easier plants in general are easier to grow than beginning gardeners think and then some of them are tougher i mean i think the greatest the greatest message that that new gardeners can can get is that uh is that plants want to grow i mean you can't kill a hosta with fire i mean people plant they plant they they bring their perennials home and they plant them in the ground and they're just you know, they're just petrified that something's going to go wrong and something's, you know, that it takes some special omniscient skill or they put a tree in the ground. And, you know, really that, that, that tree is, that tree is, is bound and determined to grow. Um, uh, uh, people have too much fear. I always tell the story about I bought, uh, I drove all the way out to Hutchinson so I could buy, uh, mums right from Vince Dooley, who was the supreme mum grower, uh, out in Hutchinson, used to ship his mums all over the world. He, he was the developer of Hardy Zone for mums. Huh. All of the mums, all the mums that you see that are Hardy Zone for mums in Minnesota, including the University of Minnesota introductions, all really originated with Vince Dooley out in Hutchinson, just this mum master. And I, I ran out there in my pickup truck and I remember buying about eight of them, just tiny little things kind of in a flat. And I opened up the tailgate of my truck and put them down on the driveway. And then my wife hollered at something. I had to run out and I got distracted and I had to run to the hardware store or something. Oh, so gosh. next thing I knew, I was like, yeah, forgot about the plants and drove my truck right over them. <sighs> just drove a pickup truck over them. And, and I 
freaked out, of course. So I, I went and got these flattened little busted up sticks and uh, the root balls were just all mashed down in and I gingerly put them in the soil and kept them watered and of course they grew perfectly well. Sure. Uh, so so writing and, and uh, researching plants, and then you run into plants that, you know, require gardening. And again, that's the renegade gardener in me. I, I tell people, you know, Sometimes I'll even say when I'm writing a plant review or when I'm doing something on my site, you know, this is one of those, it, you know, rhododendrons. You know, the rhododendrons should be sold with a with a tag on it, uh, yellow with black lettering, bold lettering that says, caution, this thing requires gardening. Amen. <laughs> you know, you can't, you know, and people will go, oh, they'll, they'll see a rhododendron in bloom in a neighbor's yard or they'll see it at the Arboretum. And so they'll go out and buy three, they'll go out and buy three, you know, PJMs or, or, you know, we have much, we have much cooler, uh, 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 roadies than that, but they'll grow and then they'll, they'll plant them into their, you know, potter's clay in Invergrove Heights. And, you know, the thing they, the, the plants will die audibly as they're placed in the ground. And they, and they wonder why their rhododendrons died. Well, this thing requires gardening. It requires special soil. It requires, but, you know, it requires some skill. But, but that's what, that's what, uh, you know, why do you golf? You golf so that you can get better. Why do you, you know, why do you play tennis? Why do you, people start to knit or sew and they're doing a sweater or they they make a something. And then, you know, people who take off on it, you know, 10, 15 years later, they make their daughter's wedding dress. I mean, the whole point of a hobby is to continue to get better. And if gardening turns you on and becomes your hobby, you have to go out and learn that certain plants probably aren't, aren't willing to grow in your yard, but you can change your soil and the other aspects of culture and grow them splendidly. And that's an achievement. That's what, that's what, what gardening is all about. Yes, we can help them bloom where they're planted. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's stuff there's stuff people will grow. I can't grow dwarf goat's beard, Arunca cestifolius, whatever. I wrote a famous article about that. I've I I've, I've seen it I've seen it growing like weeds in other gardens. And I, I, I have an article on my site where for five years I tried to grow it and I just killed it every time. And so you just you just say, Okay, you win, you know, you move on. I've got four in my backyard right yeah. now. Yeah, do they turn red in the fall? A little bit. Yeah, you know, that's they... what they're supposed to do. Yeah, I never kept them alive to fall to find out. But uh, yeah, yeah, if you can grow it, if you can grow it, God bless you. You know, I planted it. I was so excited about it. And now I, uh, this whole time I've had it for 10 years, I don't really like it. I don't like where I've planted it. And once it's done blooming, it's just a bush. You know, <laughs> it just looks like a little bush. So I, it's not one of my favorites, but I've got it and apparently I can grow it. So yeah, well, good for you. I can't. And that's just the way it is sometimes. Yeah, it is. Uh, Don, in your experience, are you seeing an explosion in gardening interest right now? It's a tough question. And I'm going to have to cheat and say yes and no. Um, people want good-looking landscapes. But I think you've got a, a burgeoning population uh, of people who just you know, they just, they, they want it, but again, it's what we were talking about earlier. They don't want to have to deal with it. They don't want to have to care for it. And that's fine. You know, as long as they hire professionals to come in and tend to it, if they, if they don't ever want to have any, any, uh, real relationship with their, with their landscape, that's fine. That's, that's their prerogative. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, let's face it, the gardening and the, the boom is over. I mean, six years, was it about six years ago now that for the first time since, since retail records have been kept, the amount of money spent in the gardening industry went down. It topped out as about a $34 billion industry. This is when you total gardening related purchases, and that would also include lawn, but Primarily plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, you know, hardscape materials, all of that stuff. You, you add it all together. You come up with the figure for the American gardening industry. Well, it, it, it actually went down six years ago. It kind of had reached its plateau and everybody freaked out. Maybe it was eight years ago now. 
And that was also when, of course, the gardening industry then started advertising gardening as simple, easy, foolproof, uh, you know, doing exactly the wrong thing. And, and retail sales have continued to go down, uh, uh, uh since then. So, so there has been a, a decrease in the amount of, uh, of expenditures on garden and landscape related products in America. But on the other hand, you know, I still run into plenty of young couples, young clients, uh, and, uh, you can never tell, but they, you know, they want the garden. They just, they just want a garden. They want a landscape. They want to take care of it. They want to learn from me. They want to, they want to experiment. Um, and, uh, you know, that's always, that's always encouraging. With these beginning gardeners, are there any pitfalls they should be aware of so that their first endeavors are successful? Any pitfalls for beginning gardeners? Um, 85% of your success or failure depends on your soil. So learn about your soil. It's part of the hobby. There's great books out there that you can bone up on. Um, you know, get a, get a proper university or laboratory soil test before you before you start gardening, if you're not familiar with your neighborhood, if you don't get to know your neighbors well enough where someone gardens and they say, oh, we're, we're, we're clay or, oh, no, you've got pretty good soil. Although that can change block to block. I've seen it change. I've done, I've done landscaping in a yard where the soil was fabulous stuff, didn't need amendments, didn't, didn't really need, you know, test it out at about a pH of 6.8. Looks really good. Maybe we added a little bit of compost as we were planting stuff and then literally as little as a quarter mile away, we're in sandy soil or potter's clay. So it, it you know, it's, it's just the luck of the glacial draw. But um, pitfalls are are um, succumbing to the obnoxious advertising, you know, and just that everything taking the easy way out. Um, uh, the whole foolproof plant. Um, you know, garden in a box, um, all of this crazy stuff um, that, you know, none of it's going to work if you're in bad soil. Um, so you have to get to know your soil. You got to get a soil test. You got to find out how to amend it. You got to find out how to create a growing medium. Um, uh, you know, particularly, of course, if you have, if you have heavy clay. Um, the other pitfall would be you've got to have patience. I think about how I've evolved after, over, um, 30 years of gardening now, you know, when I started gardening, it was like, it was like, oh, next year, I can't wait till, till next year, you know, or, oh, I can't, you know, and then and I, maybe it just comes with general aging, but, you know, now 10 years is nothing. I mean, 10 years is nothing to a gardener, you know, you, 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 you plant the tree, you nurture it, you, you go about your business and 10, 15 years later, you know, that it's got this canopy that's providing shade and you, and you uh, you appreciate it, so uh, don't be in a hurry. And the, another pitfall I should mention is is burnout. If you do succumb to gardening, let's say that the gardening bug just bites you in the butt, and 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 all of a sudden, and, and particularly if it's you and not your spouse, if 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 the level of gardening desire is not equal in the marriage, um, take it easy. Don't garden to the point of burnout. You can go out there and fall in love with gardening and you can spend your first, second, third summer just every weekend and nights after work and doing it. And then all of a sudden it's just like, you know, it's just like eating eating too many of the same Perkins breakfast or 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 eating, you know, too many too much of anything. All of a sudden you'll just realize that I don't want oh, you know, if it ever becomes a chore, if it ever becomes something that that you're tired of doing, you've been, you've been gardening too much and it, it can happen. If your spouse ever tells you that you're, she, she, she thinks, or he thinks you're spending too much time in the garden, you probably are. Yeah. You can, you can fall in love with it so hard that, that you actually burn yourself out. And I mean, it'll go, a summer will come around where you say, Oh, I don't want, well, you've been, you've been, you've been devoting too much time, you know, go to a movie. Take, take some time off. 
Well, on that note, we're going to conclude this first part of our interview with Don Ingebretson, the renegade gardener. Stay tuned for next week when we share the back half of the interview. You won't want to miss it. Today, I want to thank Don for being on the show, as well as for Mary Lynn Kenknight for being such a great co-host. I'll have all the information mentioned on the podcast today at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing Podcast. By the way, I'll put Don's contact information there as well as a link to his website, renegadegardener.com, and there will be some fun things there to reference. If you're looking for someone to help you out with a new landscape project this summer, make sure to give Don a call. I'm sure he'd be happy to help. Of course, you can always find me at facebook.com backslash still growing with Six Foot Mama, and I'll talk to you all next week. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Episodes and production notes can be found at sixfootmama.com in the top menu under Still Growing Podcast. Of course, you can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash still growing with Six Foot Mama. You can also email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Feel free to send in your questions for the Master Gardener Roundtable, which airs every other month on Still Growing. Your question will be answered either via email or during the podcast. Once again, Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Okay, PJ is going to read some poetry, and this one is by John Griefly... <laughs> This one is by John Greenleaf Whittier. All right, buddy. Here you go. Give fools their gold and knaves their power. Let fortune's bubble rise and fall. Who sows a field or trains a flower or plants a tree is more than all. This one is from Snippets and Snails and Curious Tales by Arthur Frederick Otis. My grandma used to say to me, a garden was the place to be. When I was overcome my doubt, I showed attendees to power. I pl- a place where any troubled child could could find in colors running wild and fragrances 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 to soothe the soil the soil Full. soul the balm balm to make his spirit whole okay john john is going to read the words to an old garden song Plant your seeds in a row, one for the peasant, one for the crow, one to rot and one to grow. Very nice. This one's called The Flower Girl by Charles Leland. I'm going to the garden where roses blow. I'm making a little sister, little sister of all the flowers that grow. I'll make her body of lilies because they're soft and white. I'll make her eyes of violets with dew dew drops shining bright. I'll dance with my sister all the way to the river strand, away across the water, away into the fairyland. Okay. John is going to read this little poem about earthworms by Sharon Lovejoy. If earthworms could smile, I'm sure you would see you you make your worms happy with kitchens to be. But then who can say if they smile or frown, they frown the worms little mouth or his face is ground. One more? 
sure. Okay, this is a poem called After the Rain by Grace Halleck, and it's called The Rainbow. I know a bluebill that's so very high. Where the I think it's hill. Oh. I know a blue hill. Okay. I know a blue hill, not so very high, where the rainbow ribbons are thrown across the sky. Someday and someday after a shower, I shall climb the pill and be back in half an hour. An hour. I shall wind the rainbow upon the empty spool and put it in my pocket where it is dark and cool. I shall pick a yellow star and I should pick a ye- another and bide, hide hide some in my apartment my apron my apron <laughs> to carry home home to mother thank you john all right go to bed